The eye of all the world, the ancients called it. The heart of a lost empire that had lasted for a thousand years and more. Saint Sophia, the Church of the Divine Wisdom. This was their crowning glory, the glory of Byzantium. vanished empire of Byzantium, born of pagan Rome. Byzantium, the dream of a Christian Roman empire that stretched from Spain to Syria. Byzantium, whose influence ran from northern Russia down to Nubia upon the upper Nile. Byzantium, gateway to a lost chapter of our past. The Orient Express. I first travelled this line in the 60s. I bought a ticket at Waterloo Station in London for a ride to Istanbul in Turkey and a lifelong fascination. It took three days to get there. It was hell on wheels, really. Goats in the corridor and communism out the window. Then all of a sudden, the train swung round the bend and bang! The Orient hit me in the face. A great golden city by the sea set between the east and west. You could see it had been the centre of the world. It was astonishing. I'd come to Istanbul. And underneath, the magic ruins of the lost empire of Byzantium. The Orient Express stopped here, in the heart of the old city. I got off it in clouds of smoke and steam, haunted by the ghosts of Greta Garbo and Agatha Christie, by a thousand spies and archaeologists, by the kings and courtesans of pre-war Europe. Istanbul, one of the very greatest of Islamic cities. With the monuments of the conquering Turkish sultans, who had ruled here since 1453, dominating its skyline. Underneath, though, are much older ghosts. Brushed each day by people of the living city, the ruins of Constantinople, the capital city of the Empire of Byzantium. Istanbul, Constantinople. Two names, new and old, for the same grand city. Sixteen centuries ago, in the year 330, the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian Roman Emperor, chose this city, then a small Greek town, to be his capital. No one quite knows why. One thing sure though, the great warrior emperors had left Rome and the cities of the West forever. This mosque, 
the mosque of the Turkish Sultan who conquered the city, is built straight on the foundations of the most ancient burial church of the mysterious emperors of old Byzantium. What then was this most ancient, half-forgotten empire? The empire of Byzantium. Byzantium, that magic, spicy word. Now, imagine that the empires of Greece and Rome had never died, but had been fused together in a single empire set between the east and west. And imagine that the emperors of this kingdom, the sacred emperors, could be torn to pieces by the mobs in the street Emperors who could mutilate their courtiers and children, could kill their priests and blind whole armies of invaders. Yet emperors whose artists made some of the most finest, the most exquisite images the world has ever seen. Visions of heaven and earth, sublime architectures, copied by everybody from the caliphs of Baghdad to the popes of Rome, the kings of Germany and the tribes of Nubia. Visions of heaven's order and earthly power that still lie deep within the modern world. Just as this mosque, the Conqueror's Mosque, stands on the ruins of Byzantium, so do we all. This is where the empire of Byzantium began, beside this ancient column here on Main Street. A lonely ancient relic in a modern city. In the year of our Lord 330, on a lovely May morning, a great procession came down this road. It was the highway of an ancient city called Byzantium. And the procession was led by the great Roman Emperor Constantine. And he'd brought with him a bunch of priests, pagan and Christian ones, and they were all holding an incredible collection of relics. There were 12 baskets filled with crumbs, the residue, it was said, of our Lord's miracle of the loaves and fishes. There was the very axe that Noah made the ark with. And there was a statue that the Emperor himself had brought secretly from Rome, a statue of the Greek god Pallas. And at an exact moment prescribed by astrologers, they buried their relics just over there, at the foot of the column. Seven drums of porphyry brought from the Egyptian deserts. And Constantine renamed the city Constantinople and claimed it as the capital of his grand new empire. You know, over the years, the column itself came to be seen as a relic. And the Byzantines, that's the people who lived in this city, called it Christ's Nail, because they thought that the great golden statue of Constantine upon the top had something of one of the nails from Christ's crucifixion built into it. And every year on the New Year's Day, that's the 1st of September, the Byzantines turned up at the bottom of this column and sung hymns to Saint Constantine, the founder of their city and the mighty empire called Byzantium. Constantinople was designed to be the center of the Christian world, the center of Christ's government on earth. These great cups were made to hold the mystery of Christ's blood inside the city's churches. Churches glowing with Roman gold and ancient holy images. Images that for a thousand years flooded right through Europe and the East. This, then, is Byzantium's first story, the story of how, in two short centuries, a dream was made. The dream that was Byzantium. Constantine, the Christian emperor, the man who took the faith of Jesus and the God of Abraham 
and created the beginning of the governments and churches in which the West still trusts. He was crowned, they say, at York in England in 306. For 40 years, he had killed foes and family alike, and when he died, people were so frightened of him that no one touched his body for a week. This was the extent of Constantine's ambition. The late Roman Empire, with Constantinople, not Rome, as its capital. And in the far north, in Germany, the city of Trier, a great imperial garrison. It still shows something of what ancient Constantinople used to look like. The city gate, still guarding the main road into town. A great grim gate. Like the rest of the northern frontier, Trier was continuously threatened by Huns and Goths and Vandals and a dozen other warrior nations. Constantine the Great, the Emperor himself, would have walked down this same passage 1,600 years ago. These vaults and arches are the architecture of his time. Once you were through the gate, most Roman towns look much the same. They were, if you like, a sort of an abstract idea of a city, and they were stamped on every landscape from Yorkshire to Syria. You can still sense their design in a thousand old world cities, and in the new world too. From Washington to San Francisco, planners still use parts of the same old patterns. All Roman towns had roads like this one. Wide thoroughfares that took you from the country to the heart of the city. This one is at Palmyra in the Syrian desert. For Constantinople, it was called, quite simply, the main road. Now, what you've got to see is that behind all these columns, there are little rows of shops running down the sides of the street. Butchers, bakers, candle makers, all sorts of people. In Constantinople, it would have had the goods of the known world. Africa, China, the Baltic, everything was for sale. Just imagine, the emperor is coming in in triumph. He's won a war and he's coming through the gate. The shopkeepers have been told to dust down the streets. Flowers have been strewn all over the pavements. Roses are raining down upon him. There are rugs and silks fluttering in the breezes all around him. The whole town has been sucked out to come and see him. Behind, of course, behind the main street, are all the town houses, servants, soldiers, all the people. There were taverns, brothels, everything in a city. And in amongst those, studded in amongst those, were those huge buildings that Constantine had to build before his city could really be called a Roman metropolis. It's only a little building, but it was actually the heart of ancient Palmyra. It's the Senate, the Oval Office, where government was conducted, where the town elders met, where plots were hatched, all that sort of thing. Of course, in Constantine's great imperial cities, this would have been a vast long hall. And quite often, in the central hall of government, great Constantine himself would have sat, where now the altars of Christian churches stand, because this is basically the same building. In the year 360, Constantine's son built a magnificent church at Constantinople especially for the drama of imperial communion. Next door, those same pious emperors built a giant racetrack, the Hippodrome. You can still see part of its outline in the streets. And here at last, around this old Egyptian obelisk, you can discover something of the atmosphere of ancient Constantinople. 
the heart of old Byzantium. This stone's like a giant mirror, reflecting all the life that once went on around it. There's the emperor and his family, Constantine's successors, come to the royal box to start a chariot race. There's the obelisk in the middle of the racetrack, and the chariots too, eight of them running all at once. You need a lot of luck to win. This place wasn't just a racetrack though. This is a place where people met the emperor and his court. It's the air, the space of Byzantium. A hundred thousand people roaring as new emperors are presented to them, as captives from foreign wars are brought and thrown at the feet of the emperor. It's the old parliament. It's the real heart of Byzantium. And that scene there, where have you seen it before? Look at it carefully. The emperor's in the middle with his family, just like God. Around them stand the army and the court, just like the saints. Beneath them, begging mercy, are Byzantium's enemies, the damned. It's a grand last judgment right here on earth with the emperor playing God. So that's it really. The emperor brings happiness and harmony. The theater brings luck and victory. This is the center of the world, an image, you might say, of heaven on earth. So if we'd have pushed open the gates of the imperial palace that once stood beside the Hippodrome, we'd have really been opening the earthly gates of paradise. Arcades of gold and marble, silver boats on pools of mercury, silk carpets, golden thrones in halls of porphyry and pearls. All are gone. Only echoes of them still remain in Syria and Italy. Once, though, Constantinople held the palace of all palaces, the palace of the Christian Empire. Church, hippodrome and palace, Constantine had made a sacred engine that would power Byzantium forever. To protect the holy city of Constantinople, the emperors of Byzantium built the largest city walls in all the world. Armies that controlled the lives of millions rode from these gates. And through them, passed the produce of an empire. The whole history of this city is in this gate. The great golden gate of Imperial Byzantium. You see that great high span at the top? That was once open to the skies. For 600 years, emperors and armies rode through that gate in triumph, coming back from wars against the Persians, the Arabs, the Bulgarians, the Russians. Then there was an earthquake. The gate was blocked. And that final gate at the bottom, that even a cavalryman couldn't come through on a horse, that gate was built in the final years of Byzantium. So this is a magic gate. It's a gate of legends. They say its wooden doors were covered with sheets of gold to give the gate its name. They say that the very last emperor killed fighting on these walls is buried beneath these stones, waiting for a call to take the city once again. So it's a gate of legend, but above all, it speaks of imperial Byzantine power. power to control innumerable lives. You know, there are thousands of blocks in this gate, and each one of them, each tiny mark upon them, made by an individual human hand. Endless lives absorbed in making millions of these blocks, enough to build the whole city of Constantinople. Now, this snowy marble, strange grey lines running through it, 
is found all over the Byzantine Empire, from Spain to Syria and back to Constantinople. But it comes from one island only, one tiny island in the sea. Southwest of Istanbul, three days sailing on an ancient slave ship, is the Isle of Marmara. Its very name means stone. In the first centuries of Byzantium, slaves in their tens of thousands worked in these marble hills. How the Byzantines love marble. In marble, says a priest, God trapped fields of flowers and mountain forests and fish and fruit and melting snows. The ancient blocks still strewn across the quays hint at the frantic energy that was once used to move their precious stone. Still inside the modern quarries, an ancient stone that weighs around a hundred tons, part of an enormous column to memorialize the military victories of Byzantium. If it were finished, it would have had a spiral staircase cut in it and rows of sculptured soldiers on its turning surface. It's still here, though. It cracked as it was quarried. In ancient times, these quarries were called the quarries of the Mother of God. They might just as well have been called the quarries of the Mother of Constantinople. The whole city was made here, and it was prefab city. It wasn't just sent off in blocks, everything was finished. If these had been finished and gone to Constantinople, each one had been lettered, it had its exact place in, in every one of the ancient buildings of the city. This, for example, is the very tip of a building that would have looked like a Roman temple. Modern quarry masters tell me that they find the best new seams of marble in the hills, beside the ancient stones. This would be a good spot then. A giant lonely column shaft. I've seen that same shape, so-called peacock's feather pattern, cut on a broken column lying right on the main street of old Istanbul. This was once a marble square on a highway at the middle of Constantinople. I don't suppose the Turks of modern Istanbul think much about ancient Byzantine victories. Yet there's still some fragments here of that great memorial column that made it all the way from Marmara. The ghosts of the imperial armies still lining the routes of their processions through the city. Just as all the ancient roads and sea lanes ran through the empire to Constantinople, so did the rivers of the region, channeled into great aqueducts, bringing treasured water to a thirsty city. Underneath the town, cut deep into its hilltop, an eerie underworld, some 15 centuries old, 
freshwater cisterns, so that the Byzantines could bathe just like the Romans did, in marble halls. And everything made with the dazzling technology of ancient Rome, the father of Byzantium. Marble columns, high brick vaults, the dark forests of Byzantium beneath modern Istanbul. Those Greek letters hammered into the column with a chisel point, the marks of one of Marmara's quarrymen. Food, too, flooded into the enlarging city. What a vast logistic exercise, an earthly miracle, supporting Constantinople's half a million people, Europe's biggest city, and everything, of course, by hand. There was no food industry. Everything was carried here in boats and carts. The finest fish, the Byzantines believed, were caught beside the Emperor's palace, between the rising of the Pleiades and the setting of the blood-red star Arcturus. Colours, smells and textures of the ancient everyday. The raw ingredients of Byzantine experience. The world of the ancient Mediterranean. Just like the people of modern Istanbul, the Byzantines loved fresh bread and fresh vegetables. Well, the bread, at least the grain for it, they brought from their province of Egypt, the vegetables they grew themselves. In little plots beside their houses in the city, in fields in a great green swathe that ran for mile upon mile down the walls of the city. And here's still a bit of it today, growing more or less the same crops. Look at the garlic, the onions, the dill. The dill they use to flavour fish, especially those heavy yellow fish soups they so love. And this, well, this is an ecological Byzantine delight here. There's three or four different sorts of crocs. There's rocket for salad. There's chard and cabbage again. All sorts of things, mint, all growing together in a great profusion. And at the end of it all, lettuce to calm your stomach. So when the peasants in the fields just stop there for a moment and straighten their backs to watch the lords of Byzantium, those great history makers riding by, they too could think, we're not having such a bad time either. The Byzantine economy was based on the classic Mediterranean diet. Wine, grain, cheese and vegetables and olives. Olive oil was a staple. It was Byzantium's fuel. It lit streets and homes and lighthouses. It oiled carts and cured baldness. And it was used for cooking. In its first centuries, Constantinople's oil came mostly from northern Syria. This is a wonderful thing. It's a piece of Byzantine industrial archaeology. It's a factory for making olive oil. This is a marvellous little place. I'll show you how it works. It's very sensible, very logical. The olives were picked from the trees. They came down that little street in wagons. They were tipped down through a window, and they fell into that trough down there. They were then scooped out of the trough and put into this mill. This is a great oil press for the berries. You see this drum? There were two of those, they fitted on end in here, side by side, a bar went between them, and four or five men pushed round the outside and reduced the olives, the skin, and the stone into a sort of horrible, messy pulp. That then was taken out of there and laid in these circles here. Now this thing in the wall here held a great beam that ran through the air. 
and hanging above this was a huge cylinder of stone. And that then was slowly dropped onto the massive olive paste and the oil dripped down into these tanks. Not the end, because this after all, although it's cold pressed, is actually a very impure oil at this moment. So they take it out of here and they put it into this tank here. Now this tank has already got water in it, so as they pour the olive oil in, it floats to the surface, all of the impurities go down to the bottom, and see this little trench here? A vital piece of gourmet equipment, because this is where the very finest oil ran from that impurity tank down into this tank to make fine, clear olive oil for the tables of Byzantium. This is Sajila, one of 300 ancient Syrian villages with Byzantine olive groves. Provincial Byzantium, preserved in fine cut stone. Just off the main square is the public bathhouse, forerunner of the Turkish bath. St. John cast whores and devils out of one of these. This is Sigilla's Cafe come town hall down on Main Street. Old soldiers and half-mad saints got drunk in bars like this. Money lenders, magistrates and merchants did their business here. Can you hear the farmers, tough, independent homesteaders, chuckling about the prices that the city folk were paying for their olive oil? Life was very good. There was time for both the devil and his baths, and for the church and all its works. If you'd have come up this path 1,500 years ago on the 1st of September, you'd have been accompanied by thousands of people shouting and singing praises to the Lord. It was the feast day of St. Simon of the Pillar. The first place these processions came to was this great baptistry. 10,000 people, whole cities full, had been baptised in this room in a single day. And then out they all went, praising the Lord, onwards to the Church of the Saints. It's Roman architecture still, of course. Arches, vaults and column tops. But now, there's Christian crosses too. The ancient forms are turning into something else. See? The wind of faith is bending all those ancient pagan patterns. This is the style that would become Byzantium. And at the church's hub, the remains of the 50-foot column on which St Simon lived. So who was this weird man who lived up a pillar and half the world had come to see him? When he died, they built this beautiful dancing church in his honour. Well, as a young man, Simon had worn clothes so rough they'd made him bleed. And then he dreamt up the idea of chaining his left leg to a large rock. That before he went up the column. But Simon wasn't a nutter. Simon had tremendous presence like an emperor. He sat still and silent. And in these contests between flesh and the devil, it seemed to most people that he was beyond touch. And there he was on his pillar, halfway between heaven and earth, a perfect man to settle disputes. So they used Simon. The farmers of Syria would come here when they were in arguments and he would settle one against the other. The Bedouin, the Arab Bedouin came to see him too. The emperor used to come to see him and always he acted as a balance in society. Such a terrifying balance that if he cursed somebody from the top of his pillar, a rock would explode next to the unfortunate individual. So Simon, it was a vital element in this new Christian empire. An element which somehow had taken the old stern order of the Roman age and left it 
halfway between heaven and earth. In the eastern Mediterranean, in the warm heartland of the pagan world, the first Christian empire, the empire of Byzantium, had found its balance. It was a good life, a rich life, and there was peace and plenty. You know, it always strikes me as funny when people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire. After all, standing here in Constantinople, it just got richer and richer and richer. Didn't fall at all. I suppose really it's because Rome fell. In fact, Rome didn't fall, it just got poor. Constantine had moved the capital from the great old cities of the west to here in the east, and with him moved the government, the generals, the artists and the architects. Everybody who made the empire moved with him. So in 475, that's 25 years after these walls were finished, the last Roman emperor of the west, a young man, a junior emperor, sent the crown back here to Constantinople, to New Rome. This was the new city. Now, I suppose, really, the story about the fall of the Roman Empire, that's the Western Empire, was really invented in the Renaissance by the popes, who really wanted to get the idea of a pagan empire falling and the Christian Empire of the West rising. They're good propagandists like Raphael and Michelangelo to budge them on their way. But the truth is, the real truth is, that old Rome, ancient Rome, had been modelled on the great cities of the East, on Antioch and Alexandria, all those great marble cities. So when you say Rome fell, it didn't fall at all. It simply went back home again. After the last emperor of the West resigned, Byzantium lost most of its European provinces. Only for a century, though, by the year 555, brand new Byzantine armies had ruthlessly reconquered some of them. And in northern Italy at Ravenna, they left triumphant decorations in this church as their memorial. The man there is Justinian, the emperor who 200 years after Constantine completely remade the Roman Empire the man who made Byzantium. He was a man, they said, who was gentle and approachable, a man who never showed his anger, a man who in the quietest of voices could order the death of thousands. He didn't organize the empire completely by himself, though. His great strength was as a manager. Those strong faces that surround him were the faces of a great team of men he picked together. And he didn't really care whether they were Roman patricians or from the humblest, roughest backgrounds. He himself actually come from a completely illiterate peasant family in Serbia. Justinian, though, was only half the picture. The other half was that most remarkable woman over there, the Empress Theodora. They'd married each other for love and they stayed together for 25 years. And look at the young ladies of the court there. They're looking sideways and a bit nervous. You see, it's not proper for young girls to look straight at you, not unless you're a woman of power like Theodora. But that is actually a portrait of a woman dying of cancer. Within two or three months of this mosaic being finished, Theodora was dead. Justinian ruled for another 20 years, never remarried, and he went to her grave and lit candles until he was a very old man. Though Justinian and Theodora restored the Roman Empire, this was no longer the ancient classical world. They lived in a different age, spoke Eastern Greek instead of Roman Latin, and viewed the world in very different ways. Look at these sculptures. They're probably the last classical figures ever made. They were made actually in the generations just before Justinian. Now at first glance, 
You might think they're just part of those usual old classical things you see hanging around museums. Big stony Alexanders and Caesars all strutting their stuff. But they're not like that at all. They're new, they're different. Something else is going on. It's very simple work, very realistic in a way. Little light cut lines and a day old beard lightly chiseled on the hard marble as if to emphasize its transience, its insubstantiality. These people are pensive, sad, and rather wise. After all, hadn't the saints and bishops told them that this life, this material world, was only an illusion. So naturally, these statues don't strut their stony stuff like Alexander or the emperors of Rome. They are not heroic descriptions of skin and bone and straining muscle. Each man stands inside his own mysterious inner space that each one of us must occupy. And from that space, they look outwards from the soul towards the heavens. As you might expect, if you should move around them, the solid bulk of marble and humanity is seen to be nothing more than an illusion. These brand new people, though, were clever and inventive too. Many of them were drawn here, to the centre of the empire. Most of Byzantium's brightest brains were packed into these tiny streets and apartments that surrounded the palace complex in Constantinople. There were people here come to seek their fortune at the court from all over the empire, from Spain, from Egypt, from Syria. There were mathematicians, lawyers, doctors, scientists, magicians, alchemists, all sorts of weird and wonderful people packed and living tightly together in these little streets. In the 520s and 530s, there was a great excitement bubbling up inside this unique community. Justinian and Theodora had planned to build new palaces and churches such as the world had never seen. The ancient forms, arches, vaults and column tops, were being used for something revolutionary. Something that will be echoed in 10,000 different churches for a thousand years and more. The style that is Byzantium. This seaside church, set right beside the palace, was made for some of Theodora's favorite priests. It was probably the work of one Anthemius, a famous physician and mathematician. This was where the style began. Theodora built the church to hold the blood-stained cloaks and bodies of two martyred soldiers, Sergius and Bacchus, the army's patron saints. Now it's a mosque. Anthemia's subtle compass has transformed all the usual ancient forms. Squares become circles, circles octagons, and all around a single central point. Space spins into ever smaller spaces. It's as perfectly mysterious as the finest natural crystal. The walls, the columns, seem to be nothing more than an illusion and simply fade away.
Just look at that great big glorious dome, like a huge melon, divided into 16 sections and held by eight wonderful swinging arches on those extraordinary V-shaped pillars and 28 columns through the church. It's like a vast net of stone and brick slung over this central space, this strange, mysterious space for the Imperial Communion. It's a wonderful piece of architecture and it sold all sorts of problems that you can't even see. You see, those low domes exert tremendous pressure and there's a force in this building to push the bottom of it out so the whole thing comes crashing down. Now, Anthemius, like every other architect, has used stone here as lintels and beams, as stress and strains, the old way of doing things. But he's come up with a brilliant idea to hold the church together. And it's this cornice. This huge, beautiful marble cornice with its inscription to Justinian and Theodora. This isn't just here for decoration. This links the church in a chain. It binds the stones together. A great necklace for the church brought from a shining island in a bright blue sea. Throughout Justinian's long reign, the Marmara quarries were hard at work, shipping stone for a new crop of imperial churches. This was building on a grand scale, churches for every country in the empire. But the biggest of them all was a new church for the imperial communion at Constantinople. For this, the quarry masters were cutting larger and yet larger versions of Anthemius's clever interlocking cornice. Here's a piece of one of those stone chains under construction. And here's its secret. Each block was held to the next block by a great iron bracket held in lead that ran between the two stones. Anthemius's engineers use rather a lot of iron in their buildings. It's part of a whole new series of techniques that allow them to think more daringly, more bravely than any other architects had done before. Above all, it enabled Justinian himself to have the ambition to conceive of the greatest dome the world has ever seen. Such mysterious cargoes, such magic marbles from across the empire, now sailed the seas and came to the holy city of Byzantium to be gathered up upon the site of the Imperial Communion. This is the finished dream, the tense climax of all of ancient engineering. A lively frame, built with prayer and pragmatism to hold the largest dome the world had ever seen. This, though, is just the outside of a sacred theatre. Inside, a forest of columns rises up in ecstasy. The walls, glass and gold and marble, light and dark, insubstantial and illusory, seem to simply fade away. perfect sea of space for God's holy wisdom to come down and touch the earth. A perfect theatre for the anthems of Byzantium. Lo, the lords of heaven and earth have come. Blood-red columns of Egyptian porphyry were taken, so it was said, from the Temple of the Sun at Rome. The church's wooden doors from Noah's Ark. The building's bronze was stripped from the temple of the goddess Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the pagan world. No wonder that the building has itself become a legend. Poets said 
The church combined the size of sunset and the scale of quarries. The hues of birds and fish and precious stones. All the textures and experience of that ancient everyday. The living pink of baby's fingernails. The rising of the bright red star Arcturus. In Byzantine, in Greek, this church was called the Church of Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom. All of Justinian's enormous empire, its wealth, its piety, its pagan heritage, was gathered up inside it. Throughout the next nine centuries, this vast old building stood right at the centre of Byzantium, a symbol of its true destiny on earth. And on the last day of Byzantium, the emperor and his troops came here to pray before they walked out onto the city walls to die. For these were the vaults that held the dream, the dream that was Byzantium. Pictures of Mary, Jesus and the saints. Images from the long lost empire of Byzantium. This is a journey of discovery, a search for the origins of Western faith, a tale of ancient battles that changed the world forever. in the pagan Roman Empire. Byzantium still stands at the heart of the modern world. Its ideas of heroes and of villains, of government, both good and bad, and the right of law. All the cities of Byzantium held holy images within them. Sacred pictures, it was said, that came from heaven. They were carried into battle. People died to save them from destruction. This is their story. This is the heart of the ancient palace of the Popes of Rome. It's centuries older than the Vatican and filled with holy wonders. Believers say that Jesus Christ once walked upon these steps, that they were taken from Pontius Pilate's palace in Jerusalem. The steps were brought to Rome in the first centuries of Christianity and are reverenced still by millions of people every year who pass up them on their knees deep in penitential prayer. Inside the ancient chapel at their top, Rome's most holy picture, an image made, so it was said, not by human hands at all, a portrait so powerful that when, deep in the Dark Ages, the barbarians stood at the gates of ancient Rome, the awe-inspiring image crippled the tribesmen with its paralyzing gaze and sent them running back to Germany. Paintings entirely encased in silver. The nearest you can get to it is that little face on the top, which is actually painted on linen and lays right on the ancient panel. And that type of face 
a round one with dark hair. It's probably the nearest you can get to an authentic portrait of Jesus. The original was said to have been painted on the walls of Pontius Pilate's palace by the first Christians. The real painting underneath has been entirely washed away a thousand years ago. That doesn't matter really. This is more than a picture. It is literally a window into heaven, a link between divinity and the earth. The Romans call their painting the Acheropita, an ancient Eastern word that means a picture made in heaven. It was actually made in the seventh century in the empire of Byzantium, part of a standard set of pictures of the people of the Bible. All those images come from the East. They're our most basic images of kings and gods and governments, of heroes, of mothers and villains, all those types we take for granted. And their story of how they got from the East to the modern West is an astonishing tale. They've come through fire. It's a story of blindings and hatreds and the light of faith. It's our story. And it's a part of the story of Byzantium too. The story starts in the year 360, just a few years after the Roman Empire had accepted Christianity, when a pagan pilgrim came here to the Greek sanctuary of Delphi to ask the god Apollo if the ancient pagan images would ever again be honoured and worshipped in the ancient ways. Deep down under Apollo's vast temple, an old lady sat, filled with the fumes from a volcanic crack underneath and drugged with cyanide. She babbled a reply, and a priest took down her words in classic verse. Tell the world the glorious temple has fallen. Apollo's springs are dry. The world no longer has a prophet. Using the signs and symbols of the ancient gods, Apollo's priest had just announced the ending of the pagan world. In the pagan world, the gods controlled everything. From the movements of the stars in the sky to the fishes in the sea. And their signs and symbols were everywhere. They protected crops and trees. They were in every stone. When the thunder came down, you understood it because it belonged to a god and every god had its sign. It was a complete universe and everybody felt secure in it. When Christianity took over the Roman Empire, it attacked and swept away all these signs. Now these signs were as old as man himself. And Christianity was pretty poorly supplied with alternatives. After all, it was a language of books and words. But unless it was to fail, it had to develop and develop quickly a whole new set of images for the world. The trick, the genius you might say, wasn't just to swap this ancient chaos of 10,000 pagan signs and symbols for a single set of Christian images but to find a quick way of spreading these Christian images and pictures right through the ancient Mediterranean. Books. Books were the answer. Books were invented at the same time that Christianity started. Before that, there were scrolls. Now there were pages. This is a copy of one of the oldest books in the world from the first centuries of Christianity. Look, if you flip through it, you see pictures. They're illustrating the narrative. If that would have been a Christian book, it could have gone from one end of the Mediterranean to the other and taken a whole set of Christian pictures, a story for the walls of a church. Well, that's just a copy. These images, these ancient images, are so precious that real books of that age, from the fifth century, some of the oldest pictures in the world that have come from books are now not in books but trapped in glass. Look. Here is Jupiter. This is a pagan book illustrating pagan poetry. And it's a picture of Jupiter, the king of the gods, and he's got a halo. 
just like Christian saints will have in their pictures. And he's holding a globe, just like Christ will, in a thousand churches. And he's sitting under the ark of heaven, as Christ does. And he's king of the stars and the moon and the sun. This is, this is a pose which says to you, king. You can't have Jesus, king of the world, unless he looks like a king. That looks like a king. That's where they're getting, as it were, their iconography from, straight from the pagan faith. Now look at this. Here's another one of these very precious ancient illustrations, really the roots of our Western art. Think of that. When you make gestures today, when you go victory or communism, fascism, bang, bang, you're doing universal gestures. They get emotions in you immediately. This said to the early Christians similar sorts of things. Look, here is a Roman general and his mistress and a friend having dinner. They're sitting around a table, they've got halos on. Everybody would know this was an imperial table. There's a, there's a way of drawing tables, even with a fish on a plate in the middle. You'll see that in churches. You'll see that same image, except there, it becomes the Last Supper. The first imperial images to tell the stories of the Christian Bible, to symbolize its faith, came from this city, a thousand miles to the east of Rome, ancient Constantinople, now Istanbul in modern Turkey. The Emperor Constantine the Great dedicated this column when he founded Constantinople in the year 330. From that year on, the city stood at the heart of Constantine's vast empire, the first Christian state, master of the greatest cities the world had ever seen, Alexandria, Antioch and Rome, and the capital of the brand new empire of Byzantium. From the very beginning, Constantinople really sizzled New religion, new state, new government, everything here was up for grabs. Amazingly enough, we have a good idea of how it felt to be alive inside this city and at just this time in history. It's a 1,500-year-old press photo. It's not on film, though. It's on ivory. There's the pulp of the poor old elephant's tusk. The Byzantines imported ivory from India and from Africa. This probably came from Africa because it's so enormous. It would have come, of course, through Egypt, up through the empire to Constantinople. The Byzantines loved ivory. They thought it had a texture like living skin. This, then, is the only glimpse we have of life in Constantinople in about the year 420. It's a procession. Two priests are carrying the bones of St. Stephen of Jerusalem on a royal carriage into the imperial palace of Byzantium. The mighty emperor Theodosius II is walking with his ministers and soldiers right through the center of the city. Theodosius procession would have passed up this very street. This is modern Istanbul. In those days, in the fifth century, it was called Constantinople. We're walking between the docks and the ancient center of the city. I suspect it was much the same in those days, but there would have been thousands of people watching the emperor on his way to the palace. Do you know, these processions, especially at that time, were a very tense affair. These sort of cities, these great classical cities, were a thousand years old. But the Christian bishops that ran them were starting to look at them with brand new eyes. The times really were a changing. They saw the rich on the way to church to tend to their souls, kicking beggars out of the way by the doors of the church, children mutilated by their parents to make them look more pitiful. And they saw the rich women walking, they said, with a thousand meals swinging from their ears. And they didn't like what they saw. The Christian bishops wanted a moral city, a sexless city, a pure city, and a more equitable city too. So that, perhaps, is why the emperor isn't sitting in his carriage, 
but walking in the street and carrying a candle with his courtiers, and the bones of a poor man from Palestine riding in the royal coach. The emperor's procession was on its way to a grand square, halfway between the palace and the court church. I think our ivory procession would have passed through here, right through the heart of the ancient city. Now, you see that Turkish bath over there? That's in about the same place as the gate on our ivory. And see the great high dome on the gate? And see that figure of Christ, that face of Christ on the gate? That was such a famous figure. It was called Christ of the Gateway. The most famous and influential portrait of Christ it was copied from the great shining ivory statue of Zeus of the Seven Wonders. That was parked in a palace just over there. Now, think of our procession moving along. You see, they're going past this great portico, three high stories of it, people peering out arches, looking down, swinging their incense, pleased to see the saint arriving in the city to make the new Jerusalem, joining heaven to earth. And over there, look, that's about a spot where the church, the brand new church of St. Stephen is being built. It's ready to receive the relics, but they haven't finished the roof and the tilers are still working away up there. But the Empress is proudly waiting by the door, holding a cross. And that is quite extraordinary. For the first time in the ancient world, the centre of attention is not the Emperor, but an Empress. She carries the cross of victory. She receives the holy relics into her church. It's probably the Virgin Empress Pulcheria. In that most ancient language, signs and symbols, the little ivory is telling us about an ancient revolution and one that still affects the world today. In the first years, Many of Christianity's most famous pictures were made here, in the grounds of the great monastery of St. John Studios at Constantinople. These monasteries were Pulcheria's holy battlegrounds, the places where she conjured up the sacred images and metaphors with which she waged her earthly arguments. At the centre of this ancient image factory, one of Constantinople's oldest churches, where the sacred signs and stories were put to powerful use. Imagine that it is Easter, April the 15th, 428, and that this nice new church is filled with all the nobles of Constantinople, men downstairs, women upstairs in the galleries. Suddenly, there is a great hush. The Imperial Guard and the Emperor and all his family have walked into the church. Now, in the middle of these churches, there's a stone pulpit. For more than a century now, preachers have been giving fire and brimstone from these pulpits, using all the language, all the signs and symbols of the Christian faith and the ethics of the Bible. They laid out the whole structure of this brand new Christian emperor. And the emperor and his family listened in humility. Right on this line here, there was an altar rail. It separated the main body of the church from the high altar. Only the emperor and his priests were allowed in here, close to the divine mystery of communion. In 428, though, things were rather different. Theodosius, the emperor, was usually accompanied to the altar by his sister, Bulcaria. They'd ruled together since they'd been children. Two frightened toddlers in a palace filled with intrigues and plots for the succession. When she was 14, 
Pulcheri had hit upon the answer. She dedicated an altar to her own virginity and to the rule of the emperor. From that moment on, they ruled a strange, sacred couple like Joseph and Mary, and there were no plots for the succession. It had also given Pulcheria a unique role within the church. On that particular Easter day, though, things turned out rather differently. Pulcheria's way to the altar was barred by the new patriarch of Constantinople, one Nestorius. He said that only men could enter the sanctuary. Pulcheria was aghast. Her new role as a virgin had projected women in a different way. She was as pure as gold, she said. She had kept herself as soft as fleece to receive the Holy Spirit. Have I not given birth to God, she cried. Nestorius, though, was a man of the old school. He preferred to see women as the daughters of Eve, that unfortunate lady who dabbled in snakes and sex and sin. You, he said to Pulcheria, have given birth to Satan. And there you have it, really. The three roles of women laid out in the early Christian church. Sinners, virgins, and mothers. By opening the debate, Pulcheria not only advanced the role of the Virgin Mary and women in Byzantium, but defined the role of women in Christendom forever. Encouraged by Pulcheria, the next full council of the church declared Mary the mother of Jesus to be Mary the mother of God. It was a defining moment. Nestorius' challenge to the Empress Pulcheria was now seen as an insult to the Virgin Mary. He was declared a heretic and exiled. Thanks to Pulcheria, the family of the Emperor of Byzantium had become a mirror image of the Holy Family in the Court of Heaven. That is why these medieval emperors offer their city and an image of this church, St. Sophia, Byzantium's cathedral, for the protection of the Virgin Mary. Christ's mother is their mother too. After Pulcheria, the emperors of Byzantium ruled by divine right and by right of birth, and all later Western kings imitated them. Pulcheria had cast that spell of power and sanctity that still surrounds the offices of government today. She'd also changed the way that men saw women and women saw themselves. Once more, ancient images tell the story. Pagan Greeks and Romans loved public displays of sexuality inside the city. They seemed to hold the force of life within them. They gave assurances of immortality. The Christians, though, had gazed upon eternity. Just as they destroyed the pagan temples, so they attacked the pagan body image. Byzantine preachers said that the silent power of nakedness threatened anarchy within the family and the state, and it was covered up. Women like Bulgaria, who once had flaunted wealth and beauty at the public baths, now lived regretful, celibate, in hermits' huts inside their marble palaces. No longer was each man an Alexander, and every woman Venus. Right through the empire, the cities of Byzantium were filling up with Christian piety. Yet it was still a magic, superstitious world. A world, too, where those who knew the will of God held quite enormous power. Hermits like St. Simon of the Pillar, who preached in Syria, 
and did not hesitate to question the behavior of the emperor himself. Since you have become arrogant, O Emperor, and since your heart has forgotten the Lord, your God, who gave you the imperial crown and the imperial throne, and since you have become a friend of the feckless, faithless Jew, then know this. Soon you will face divine judgment, and then you will raise your hands to heaven and moan. Impiety, then, brought down the wrath of God. Piety, on the other hand, brought prosperity, good government and victory too. The preachers kept their eyes on the great cities and on the countryside as well. For the people who fed and fueled Byzantium were also at the mercy of the Lord. Deep in Turkish Anatolia, this little village was once the city of St. Michael of 10,000 angels, famed for its fine churches. In Byzantium's countryside, life was on a knife edge between prosperity and starvation, between flesh and the devil. Magic stones still eased the pain of reaping and of childbirth. Magic images, half cockerel, half snake, all dressed in armour, still kept the evil eye at bay. Byzantium was built on the memories of this pagan past, sometimes even from the same old stones. Ancient demons haunted the countryside, stopped up wells, curdled milk and threatened plague and madness. Many saints were really doctors, ministering to a madness born of holy terror. Their prayers drove out the ancient devils, safeguarded animals and crops. For archaeologists, of course, such goings-on are very hard to excavate, yet sometimes there are clues to them. Still lying on the swelling earth, If you ever wondered what attracts archaeologists to one place rather than another, this hill is a wonderful example. Just look at its shape. It's a bit strange in the landscape. Look at all this white stone. This is building stone. Well, that's interesting, you might think. But then I found this. See? It's a very rare piece of marble, just like the Byzantines used to use to clad the walls of buildings. So it's quite a rich building. Here's a bit of the roof. So we got the walls and the ceiling, everything you could need. What the devil is it? Well, look a bit closer. And here you can find something absolutely unique. This field is studded with tiny little bits of glass. These bits of glass are very special. These are mosaics and they were made from the 5th to the 7th or 8th centuries. That makes this field unique. Look around and you'll soon discover why such a sophisticated city church was built here deep in the countryside. Long before the Christians took over its magic, this area had been a pagan sanctuary, a place of sacred springs and running waters, a little paradise. Well, this is the place that's given this region its name, Old Turkish Yurme, Greek, Germia, Roman, Thermae. That's a hot spring over there. Once it was a great pagan shrine. That Christian church then, that Christian church on the hill with those mosaics, perhaps that's its exact descendant. It's a magic place. Once there were many places like this in Anatolia. Once upon a time, in the early years of Christianity, a pagan washerwoman called Hypatia said that she would become a Christian only if she could see the face of Jesus for herself. And straight away, the story goes, she found a portrait of the Lord floating on the waters of the village spring. 
and she was very frightened and clutched the picture to her breast. And then Hypatia found she had two pictures, the original panel and another imprinted on her dress. It was a miracle. Such powerful images, fallen straight from heaven and mysteriously duplicating, are called Acheropita. Tradition has it that several of them still survive. The Acheropita in the ancient palace of the popes at Rome. The great shroud of Turin. In the 6th century, Hypatia's panel painting became Byzantium's battle icon, a picture to paralyze the enemy with a terrifying gaze. With such miraculous signs and symbols, how could the Byzantines ever lose? Yet lose they did, and with that loss, Byzantium and all its signs and symbols were forever changed. These are the ruins of a Byzantine border fortress, set right up on the edge of the Syrian desert. In the seventh century, the east exploded. The Byzantines moved on Persia, and the Persian armies moved towards Byzantium. Vast battles rolled back and forth across these plains for a quarter of a century and more. These magisterial armies with their gold and silver and their standards and their generals and all the panoply of ancient war. And at the end of it, all of Persia was destroyed and all of Byzantium had been sacked except one city, that of Constantinople. And at the same time as this tremendous battle was going on, small tribes were infiltrating up through the empire. One of them brought bubonic plague. It was so bad in Constantinople that 10,000 people a day died from it. The bodies were piled in a fortress and a terrible smell of death hung over the city. One of these tribes from a Byzantine trading city in Arabia found a great prophet in their midst, Muhammad. Muhammad had the ability to turn a personal religious revelation into an immediate political reality. Fired by his genius, the armies of Islam swept through the devastated landscapes of the East. In 636, in a gigantic battle on the Golan Heights in Syria, the Byzantines were crushed. Not long after, the best part of the Byzantine Empire, that vast empire that once had run from Spain to Syria, was ruled by Arab courts. At the same time, the nation of the Slavs had broken through the northern Byzantine defences on the Danube and were raiding south, down into Greece and even threatening Constantinople. Old Byzantium was completely broken an ancient way of life was coming to an end. The story of the Syrian city of Apamea could serve for a hundred others. Apamea had been a huge rich city for a thousand years. In pagan times, it had had a sprinkling of philosophers and fine temples. Antony and Cleopatra came here on their honeymoon. Byzantine Apamea, too, had its share of elegance, of churches, relics and fire-eating bishops. There'd been hundreds of cities like Apamea throughout the empire of Byzantium. But now, after the great wars, they'd all collapsed. It's very difficult to see a disaster in archaeology. Things stop, all you get is ash. In the Byzantine Empire, coinage practically stopped being issued. This meant that nobody could collect taxes, nobody could mend anything anymore. There were no inscriptions. History practically stopped. After the seventh century, 
the survivors came back into the ruins and started to build little houses and small fortresses amongst the great spines of the broken cities. At that point in the world, Constantinople was the only imperial city left unconquered. You could say that Byzantium had changed from an empire of cities to an empire of fortresses. Much of 7th century Constantinople must have looked like this. Old Monomvasir in southern Greece. The city's walls protected refugees from the lost empire. Soldiers, craftsmen, landowners. Its churches were filled with images from 10,000 distant shrines. Its open squares and public highways were choking up with curving lanes and little alleyways. The scale of life had changed completely. People now stayed by the family fireside, read books in silence by themselves, cultivated their souls, engaged in clandestine love affairs. Even patterns of eating and drinking changed. Take bread, for example. Corn in Constantinople largely came from Egypt. After the Arab invasions, there was no corn from Egypt. No free bread handouts, first time in hundreds of years. Worse than that, the wheat that came from the north actually tasted different, but it rose, it rose like modern bread. And that's really where the modern loaf starts, I think. But it wasn't just the food you eat, it was actually the way you ate it. Ancient people had sat on couches and been served by slaves. They didn't really have knives and forks, there was nowhere to put them. Now, with chairs and tables, people were sitting down so that the great classical spoons were filed down to make a little fork which you could prod the food. Pretty soon people would be cutting their own food up with knives. Other changes too. With the loss of Syria to the Arabs, practically all the olive oil trade dried up. So you had to light your house with candles. They were quite expensive. Not so many fry-ups either. There were more boiled foods now from the north. Northern foods called more for, for beef than pork. The northerners too brought different clothes with them. Byzantium was cold. People took up wearing trousers for the first time. And those tough guys from the north with their long hair began to be copied by the Byzantines. If you want to look cool and groovy and wild, you look like a northerner. The old classical world was disappearing. Behind the high stone walls, there was uncertainty and stress and fear. And in the age-old way, Byzantium expressed this change of mood with the signs and symbols of its faith. This is a very good example of what I mean. In its day, this coin was absolutely unique. Instead of having a picture of the emperor on the front, it had a picture of the Christ that was over the palace gate. It's extraordinary. Nobody knows why it was done. One sure thing it did, it cut the Arabs off from using it because they didn't agree with religious portraits. So the Byzantine exchequer was sort of shut off from them from this moment because the coins had a picture of Christ on. There's another side to this too. There were lots of Byzantines at the same time who didn't like pictures of Christ. There was a debate broke out inside Byzantium, whether it was a good idea or not a good idea to have images. It was a debate that went on with blindings, burnings, maimings and ferocity for over a hundred years, and it changed Byzantium forever. By the 8th century, after the invasion of Byzantium, Constantinople, the ancient capital, stood at the center of a gathering storm. A storm called iconoclasm, which means quite literally, the destruction of the images. In the year 730, there was a whole lot of agitated people milling around in this square. They'd come here because they'd heard that the emperor wanted to take down the great picture of Christ that hung above the palace gateway. They loved the picture. They didn't want it taken down. It healed the sick. Now, this painting stood under the great high arches of the palace gate somewhere over there. 
and a soldier put up a ladder to go and get the painting and somebody rushed out of the crowd and pushed the ladder down and killed the soldier. But the other soldiers took the painting down and arrested the person who'd killed their friend and they had her executed and Saint Theodosia, the virgin martyr, became the first victim of iconoclasm. Iconoclasm, the cataclysm of the paintings. This movement that started in the palace of Byzantium to destroy all holy images. 30 years after they took the picture down from the palace, the iconoclasts, that is the people who were destroying the images, went through the great church itself. The patriarch was murdered, all the images were taken down. And though the angels came down from heaven, so it was said, and beat the impious emperors, the iconoclasm continued. Glass mosaics were pounded into dust. Books were ripped apart. Wooden panel paintings chopped into pieces. And the blood of the holy images, so it was said, soaked the clothing of the iconoclasts. It wasn't only little things either. The monuments of the city were actually covered in images. This, for example, was part of a great milestone that stood at the center of the city. The emperor decreed that the sacred image of the Virgin that it contained should be scraped away and a picture of his favorite charioteer put up in its place. What on earth was going on? Once more, signs and symbols tell the story. About the year 750, that same emperor who so hated holy images restored this fine old church, St. Irene's in Constantinople. The plain cross is the measure of the man, the pious emperor Constantine V, a single-minded soldier. Like other emperors and generals of the time, Constantine V believed the sacred pictures were evil in the sight of God. The church contains no other images. We move in a dangerous and mysterious age. Part of the dark mystery of iconoclasm was actually sold a few years ago in the Vatican Library by the study of this old book. Now this book well, it was clearly more than a thousand years old, but the text in it was twice as old as that and more. This is called Ptolemy's Handy Tables, and it was written in ancient Alexandria and Egypt, and it describes all the passages of the stars and the sun and the moon through the sky. What was so remarkable about this copy of it was not simply its beauty, but also the fact that it had been written at the height of iconoclasm, right at that burning beginning when every image in the churches were being destroyed. Now the key of this book and the central image of it is this beautiful plate in the front. And it shows you, it's a sort of a diagram from the most ancient world of astrology. There's the zodiac signs around the edge, all those wonderful old signs all added together to make a sort of cosmos. And in the middle, this iconoclast artist has actually painted Apollo, the sun god. This is the ancient Greek world. It revolves around the sun. And there's Apollo in his chariot sailing through the sky. Isn't that extraordinary? These pious emperors who think so deeply and so hard about Christianity put Apollo in his chariot at the center of the universe. Why didn't they've done that? The truth is, of course, this man is interested in these old pagan values. He's thinking of luck. Charioteers, his favorite charioteers, ran races and won them in the center of Constantinople. The charioteers brought luck and victory to his city and that's what these iconoclasts wanted. They wanted a pure Christianity, but they wanted that most ancient virtue, luck. In the great spasm of iconoclasm that passed through Byzantium in the 700s, the monasteries and nunneries along this lonely coastline to the south of Constantinople sheltered both the artists and the holy images. The battle for the icons 
ebbed and flowed throughout Byzantium like a summer storm. But you know, those pictures never really left the people. They were too much beloved. The monks really fought for them. The monks of the great imperial monasteries of Constantinople, the monks that lived here in this idyllic land along the coast of Marmara, they died for those pictures. There were icons too, even in the royal palace. The ordinary people liked them. The people in the royal family liked them. Constantine V's own son was married to a girl from Athens called Irene, who kept icons in the palace. Now, Irene was an interesting lady. She wanted the icons back. And when her son finally became emperor in his own right, she took him back to the room where he'd been born, a room of shining porphyry, and had him blinded and restored the pictures. That terrible story of Irene wasn't the end of the iconoclasm. Fifty years later, they were still torturing people who liked pictures. A painter called Lazarus had his hands forced down on sheets of red-hot iron to stop him painting, and still he got a paintbrush in his crippled hand and painted a new image of the Halke Christ on the gate of the Imperial Palace. And that, as the people of the city knew, was the restoration of the pictures. In the year 867, on the 29th of March, the Patriarch of Constantinople, one Photius, dedicated the first pictorial mosaic in the Church of St. Sophia, the great cathedral of Byzantium. Beside it, in mosaic, was a single sentence these images that the heretics cast down have been set up again by pious emperors. The iconoclasts had lost the century-old debate. Even in her image, Photius tells us, the Virgin graces and delights. She strengthens and she comforts us. Once again, the holy pictures filled Byzantium with their unearthly presence. In Saint Sophia, images of Christ were placed up in the dome and here, above the church's central door, where only the emperor could enter. Not the favorite Western image of a mortal Christ impaled in time upon a cross, but the old familiar figure from the palace gate, Christ of all time and of all places, Christ, Lord of the cosmos. Before this ancient image, penitent emperors now prostrate themselves in awe. Not long ago, there was a better ending to this story. Here, in the ancient walled city of Nicaea, close to Constantinople. In the first years of Byzantium, the Christian creed had been written in this pretty little city, and approved here too, by the first council of the church. Over the following centuries, Nicaea had filled with little churches. One of them, a miniature Saint Sophia, decorated with mosaics that celebrated the return of icons after the iconoclasm. Now though, you can only see the glittering scenes in old photographs. The triumphant angels, the exquisite Madonna drawn over the shadow of the iconoclast's plain cross. All of this was blown away in the Greek and Turkish wars of 1922. And each side still blames the other. How is it that people can show such tremendous ferocity to such quiet beauty, such passive images? Well, I think it depends upon the way you look at pictures. 
You see, that virgin that stood here in the nave of this church, like the one in St. Sophia, wasn't like a Western picture. It wasn't just a picture of a woman in a blue dress sitting on a chair with a sacred baby. It wasn't like a record of an event. These pictures were actually intended to actually take part of the identity of the Virgin, part of the eternal cosmic identity of the Virgin. Something was there at the beginning of time and there at the end of time, and you had it in your church as every little icon, every little picture throughout the empire refracted these bits of holiness throughout the empire. The emperors didn't want that. They wanted to gather all that dispersed holiness around their own person in the city, along with the sacred relics inside their palace, just as they collected the taxes. So they wanted that power to themselves. But the Byzantines came from one of the most ancient cultures of the Middle East. The people wanted their images. So the triumph of the pictures, you might say, is really a compromise. The emperor gets his sacredness, his divine power, and his taxes in Byzantium, and the people get their pictures. The compromise is the most indelible aspect of the Byzantine identity. This is a picture of a procession carrying an icon, and it was made six centuries ago in the last years of Byzantium. It gives a precious glimpse of Constantinople's most famous image of the Virgin Mary, painted, it was believed, from the life by St. Luke himself. Underneath are some of those who centuries before had fought iconoclasm and found their way to paradise. Saint Theodosia, the Virgin Martyr, the abbots of the monasteries, the artists, they hold the pictures that they died for. Pictures painted with such passion and precision, such blazing color, such quiet power. They say that on the last night of Byzantium, on the evening of Monday, the 28th of May, in 1453, just hours before Constantinople fell to the armies of the Turks, that the Virgin came down into her city for the last time and took her picture back to heaven.